Hey guys, we are back to discuss more of Genesis. We're moving into Genesis 4. It says, And Adam knew uh, Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, and said, I have gained a man, Yove. So she is giving glory to the Lord. Notice, she's the first person documented to actually call the Lord Yove, to call him by his name. Um, and that would be by the yod hey vav hey. Um, so she's acknowledging, she sees him, the merciful one, right? She totally understands. I mean, think about it. Eve, Adam and Eve have probably lived a life of continuously remembering how merciful he is that they didn't have immediate death, right? He's still going to allow, even with sin coming in, he still allows Adam and Eve to, um, do what they were commanded to do, which was to populate the earth, right? To um, recreate, not recreate, but to, to what do I want to say? To multiply, right? And be fruitful. He is still allowing them to keep the commandment to him, even though they fell in this other one regard of eating the tree. I just, wow, what a merciful God. Listen, the God of the Old Testament is the same as the God of the New Testament, right? He says he's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, which means if he's merciful in the New Testament, you better believe he's merciful in the Old Testament. He is a just God. He is a merciful God. And he is one who is um, ready to forgive, but he also will bring justice. And, um, but, well, because he loves you. Because a part of love is also, if you said you're going to get spanked for touching that, then you spank your child for touching it because you love them. And that's what proves that they can trust your word. So she conceives a child and she's like, ah, I've got a man child. This is great. It says in verse two, and again, she gave birth to his brother, Abel. And Abel became the keeper of sheep and Cain became a tiller of the ground. All right. Um, so let's, let's look at this real quick. The very first child is Cain and she is elated. She's like, thank you, Lord, for the man child. Because remember, she was just given the understanding of your seed and his seed, meaning the seed of the Lord, that's going to be some sort of miraculous seed because woman doesn't have seed. And this is why she, the Lord has gave me a man in hopes of this is the one who's going to crush the enemy, the his seed. Now, do they have a clear understanding of what his seed, meaning the enemy's seed looks like? Probably not. I mean, shoot, I don't think we really have a clear understanding exactly of what that looks like. We know that, and we'll learn in chapter 6, that there is um, what's called the Nephilim. There are fallen angels who <clears throat> come and, um, um, I guess, help create the enemy's seed. So you, you do have these two warring seeds. Um, but then not only that, you have this mixing. And this mixing is what creates the seed of the enemy. Whereas a pure seed is what creates the, uh, the Messiah. All right. So she's giving thanks to God for giving her this man who's going to conquer. And what's interesting is the second when she gets Abel, it's kind of like, oh, yeah, okay. So then there's this other guy. And Abel's name is kind of like not satisfied. Well, what's the word? Um, unsatisfactory, I guess. I mean, he's kind of like, well, yeah, okay, second runner-up, who cares? Because this one is going to conquer. Not understanding that, no, 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 there's thousands of years before the seed of Messiah comes that's going to conquer the enemy's seed. But let's just say this, that while right here you have Adam and Eve not having the completion of the story, well, when Yeshua comes, that perfect seed, there still isn't the completion of the story. In other words, while... While Jesus did it all, the story is still playing out on earth because the enemy's, enemy's seed is still not eradicated. It's still not gone. It's still around. And it will be because it has to create, I guess, its fullness of sin has to happen so that every aspect of it is judged in the end when Messiah does come. Now, he does defeat death, but remember, he uses death. Jesus and the Lord use death even all through Revelation. 
And in the very end, death is thrown into um, the lake of fire, along with Satan and everything else. So, this is an entire story. This whole process is the fight of those seeds. So, her idea is, well, Cain's going to do it. I don't really know what what Adam's here for, not Adam, um, what Abel's here for, but that's okay. All right, so notice that Cain is the firstborn. He takes on the job of his father. He is a tiller of the ground. That's what his dad did, right? We know that from Genesis 3. He's told, go on out there, till the ground, work for it, and Cain does that. But Abel is a shepherd. Oh, what another great example of Messiah. I mean, Jesus is considered a shepherd of Israel, right? He is the shepherd. He may not have been a shepherd while here on earth. He was more, well, he was a carpenter, planter type person, all right? But when he returns, he will be the shepherd. He will be the king that shepherds. So we have Abel as a second born. Remember the first Adam, er, messed up. Second Adam will complete it. Well, here we have Cain, the first, er, it's going to mess up. And the second who doesn't have the chance to finish it because he's killed. We're going to see that. So let's move down to verse 3. 4, 3 says, And it came to be in the course of time. Ah, that term, a course of time, is said to point to the end times. Remember our bookends? We have Genesis and Revelation, and then it starts to move in, right? And then we have that center, basically, with Messiah coming and dying in the grave and rising again, right? That's that's the link between them. And by that, I mean it's a continuation of the story. We have the first seed, and then we wait for the, the um, destruction at the very end. So then here we have in the course of time, which can mean in the end time. So we have, and it came to be in the course of time that Cain brought an offering of fruit um, of the ground to Yove. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and their fat. And Yove looked at Abel and his offering. And he did not look at Cain and his offering. And Cain was very wroth, very upset, and his face fell. You know, for countenance to fall, face fell. Some of your Bibles may say countenance. But really, that is, we show the expression of our face from what's inside. So when their face falls, it's because their countenance falls. That feeling inside, that connection falls, right? It starts to get, oh, well, I should do this. You start talking to yourself about kind of how um, we've been wronged. Usually that's what it is. We don't like something that happened. We've been wronged and our countenance falls. And the Lord's like, don't do that. Let's look at this whole situation. First of all, how do they know how to bring offerings to the Lord? You notice it says they bring offerings. It doesn't say sacrifices. They're bringing offerings. They're bringing offerings to the Lord because they want to freely give. Because Adam and Eve had learned how. Remember when the Lord gave them coats? So this is something that they have learned. They have learned how to approach the Lord. Leviticus talks about if you want to draw near, you bring something to the Lord. You bring. And I really do believe that the blood, where it says there's life in the blood, I really believe there's a lot going on there. That when we bring the life, when we bring the blood, it allows a connection between the Father and between us. It allows, um, I don't want to say this, it allows kind of in a spiritual realm there to be life and life. In other words, I can't give him my life and move on, then I'll be dead. But if I can bring the blood of something innocent that has life in it, it's like it's taking my life and then it is being brought before the Lord. Because I can't stand before the Lord. I would die. I'm not in the appropriate um, um, clothing. I'm not in a glorified form like Adam and Eve were. Remember when they fell out of that? They had to get out of that presence of the, of the center of the Lord. They had to get out. They were going to die. So they got out. He clothed them. Um, and so here we have where they're doing an offering. They're giving an offering. And they're wanting to draw near. So Cain brings the first fruit of the ground. Now a lot of times you have people who will teach that, well, the problem here is Cain didn't bring blood and God only wanted blood. That's not true either. Leviticus 1 through 4 tells us all the different types. 
And if this is a first fruit offering because they're so thankful and they want to share with the Lord, it makes perfect sense that Cain is bringing from the crop because he grows things. And Abel is bringing from the sheep because he's a shepherd. They're bringing their best. But one of the hints here is that Cain didn't bring his best. Cain just brought some leftover fruit, some leftover food. But Abel brought his top, his best, his most prized of his sheep. And so the Lord looks upon, because he's like, you really do want to share with me your first. So he looks upon Abel's and accepts it. But Cain's, he looks upon it and he doesn't actually don't even look upon it. He's like, meh, I'm not taking second best. All right. If you bring it to me as if it's your best, then it needs to be your best. But, but Cain didn't do that. There's also the thought that um, others will say, well, they have a problem with each other. And so Cain bring, excuse me, Abel brings two because it says uh, in verse four, the flock and their fat, meaning plural, there. So the thought is, oh, he brought two. Maybe he brought one as um, offering a guilt offering, meaning the brothers have an issue with each other. And so Abel comes, he forgives his brother, and then he forget, he puts it before the Lord as saying, I'm sorry. And then he provides his first fruit. However, if that is the case, then Cain also should have brought an offering, which would have required an animal, a uh, sheep, should have brought a sheep or a lamb to the Lord and then his first fruit. So it is possible that there's blood missing because it would be a guilt offering that's missing. But it's not necessarily that. And we can't say that Cain's wrong because he didn't bring blood because that, that isn't really, it doesn't line up with Leviticus. It, it, it doesn't line up with the fact that there are many offerings that are given to the Lord that do not have an animal involved in it. It has wheat, it has um, cakes, it has first fruits of whatever it is that you have. All right. Okay, so let's continue really quick. It says right here in verse 6, And the Lord said to Cain, Yahweh said to Cain, Why is he wroth with you, uh, towards you, and why is your face fallen? Wow, there's so much there. 2 Peter 2, 19 is a good one if you want to go read that. Proverbs 15, 8 is another good verse if you want to read that. And Proverbs 15, 13 is a good verse if you want to read that about countenance. So we have, why is he wroth with you? Hmm, why is he upset with you? This is another possible hint of the idea of Cain, um, excuse me, Abel being like, wait a minute. Why didn't you bring an offering, a guilt offering, and uh, why aren't we mending this? This could be a forgiveness thing. The whole, let, let's think about in Matthew where it says, before you bring a gift to the Lord, go and put your gift down and go and apologize. Go and get things right if there's a problem between you and a brother. If they're upset with you, you still stop and you go and you say you're sorry or you, you mend it. So there's a thought also that that's what's happening here with the brothers. That Cain wasn't interested in mending the issue, but Abel was. And we kind of hint to that, or it kind of hints to that again in verse 8. We'll look at that in a little while. But um, I, I guess we'll end with this, that the discussion of the two brothers coming before the Lord with an offering, it's, it's well established that they know what they're doing. And the Lord's holding them accountable for doing it the way that he told them to. That's been taught to them. And Cain is not following the instructions that have been given. That's really what this boils down to. Cain was thought to be the one that was going to defeat the enemy. And yet Abel, yet then Cain falls to him. And yet Abel, through his blood and example, is going to be used in Hebrews. And we'll look at that in a little bit too. So we'll just end on that. Kind of an odd place to end. But we want to come back and look at verse 7, which is packed with all kinds of ideas. So thanks for listening. Thanks for sharing a few minutes with me of your day. And I hope that you're really being able to get in the Word and let it become a part of your DNA. All right. Thanks. See you soon. Bye-bye.